It's wonderful to have you all here this morning for a very special presentation, and I'm glad you're here uh, because we did have a little glitch in getting publicity out. So, uh, those of you who love the history of East Ham and, and, and interns, you're going to really love this presentation. It's a pleasure uh, that I introduce a fellow East Ham historian, history master, <laughs> because we launched, literally launched Market Daily on this adventure to find out what was the story of the turn of farming in East Ham. And we're happy we did. So we're here this morning to present the results of that journey. Oh, and, and hello to our Zoom audience. Do we have a Zoom audience? Oh, yeah. Morning. Big one. Where are they from? Around. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? Because yes. if you can't, I can turn it up. Oh. Oh. That's for my brother and he made me say that. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you are from East Ham. I know you know more about turnips than I do. What I knew would fit on the head of a turnip seed. If you know what turnip seeds look like, you know that they are tiny. Poppy seeds, bird shot. Um, but I learned, and I learned because I have to introduce myself, and that way it will come across. <coughs> so I was born and raised in East Ham, and I grew up here. I left after college and spent the next 40 years or so between East Ham and Athens, Greece, with a few side trips over 10 years to New Zealand and up to England and all over the Middle East and Europe and it was wonderful. But almost 10 years ago I came back to my roots here and became involved with the East Ham Historical Society. Mainly because I loved hanging out with my aunt Dorcas Gill and she was always at the Swift Daily House as a docent on Fridays along with Bobby Cornish. And so I would hang out with Annie Darkie and Bobby, and as I said when I gave tours, that the local color of growing up and playing games in that house as a kid. Um, Bobby retired from being the archivist, and she got me involved in helping her in the archives. And earlier this year, I became the archivist. So when Debbie asked me if I would do a talk on turnips, I knew that I knew all right, I knew Art Nick, <laughs> and I knew turnips in East Ham. And I'd heard of the turnip festival, but because I taught overseas, I didn't know it per first hand. That was about it. But I also knew where I could look. And since my brother, Alfred Mills, is newly moved to East Ham, and newly volunteers at the archives, I got him to go with me into the bowels of the old 1869 schoolhouse to see what we could find. So I am presenting this on behalf of the East Ham Historical Society, and Alfred helped me out immeasurably. So the archives are in the old schoolhouse. They're down in the basement. It's climate controlled. Um, humidity, temperature, and it includes a plethora of different kinds of sources. I was going to read them to you, I've got them in my notes here, it's the bottom paragraph, but I'm not going to because as we go through the presentation, you'll actually, whoops, okay, onto the floor, see um, the kinds of sources that we use. Um, what's East Ham known for? Turnips. Asparagus. Asparagus. Yes, yes. Strawberries. Strawberries. The cake club, the miniature lighthouse. Here is a poster made by Jim Owens and the 1953 East Ham Town Report, um, which offered their own suggestions of what East Ham is known for. 
And what I especially love is the town report um, because it represents four phases of life in East Tam. Fishing, shell fishing, turnips, and tourists. And it was noted in that report that in 53, turnips were still grown as a cash crop to be shipped off the Cape. And that's something that happened, it began in the early, late 1800s, around 1870 or so. But we'll get into that history. What came to me in the middle of the night last night was uh, Professor Emmanuel Leroy Ladouri, who was a historian. And when I used to teach theory of knowledge, I did presentations on the different disciplines. And for the historical discipline, a really good friend of mine, Jan Cavignatis, from the American Community Schools in Athens, shared his two perspectives of historians. And the one perspective is that of a parachutist. You're up over the land, looking down, and you have a huge overview of what's down there. And the other perspective is that of a truffle hunter. You're really rooting around down and get the details of the particular events that you're looking at. So for this presentation, which I had a really hard time structuring because Alfred and I came up with so much information. I'm going to start with the overview, the parachutists, and it will be the history of East Ham. And because not everyone is a history buff as much as Bob and I are, um, I'll go through that, I hope, rather quickly, and then we'll get into the details, the truffle hunting, all right, the turnip hunting, if you will, um, with East Ham turnips. So, here are four maps of East Ham in different periods. Um, and East Ham's boundaries changed in the early days. Founded as Nauset in 14, um, 1646, Incorporated as East Ham in 1651. The land was 15 miles by two and a half. Did I get something? I did. Um, it went from Herring Brook, up at Billings, known as Billingsgate in Truro, all the way to Monomoyet, <laughs> nowadays Chatham. And so the land mass was about 37 square miles. That changed when Wellfleet separated in 1762 and Orleans separated in 1797. And so East Ham became a town of six miles by two and a half, as they said, with a land mass of about 15 square miles. Um, and it's been that way since 1800. The population of East Ham, take a look at these numbers because they're chronological. They come from uh, Reverend Enoch Pratt of Brewster, his comprehensive history, ecclesiastical and civil, of East Ham, Wellfleet, and Orleans, County of Barnstable, Mass, um, from 1644 to 1844. And, no, sorry, that was published in 1844. And then Simeon Deo's History of Barnstable County was published in 1890. And those are my two very favorite history books to go to when anyone in the archives has a question about East Ham or anything on the cave in the history. They are so detailed. Um, as you can see from this, the population went from about 50 to 2,000 in 100 years. And then came the decline. And the decline has many reasons, 
ups and downs, mostly downs. Um, and one of those was the epidemic of 1816. East Ham was the epicenter of that epidemic. And more than 70 of East Ham's 700 inhabitants died, which means 10% of the population was lost in that over four months, not just in that year. Another decline was from 1830, when we had 950 approximately, to 1870, over 40 years, we lost 31% of our population. So East Ham was not very densely populated, only about 41 people per square mile. Contrast that with Provincetown, which had a shipping community, and they had a population density of about over 400 people per square mile. It was also much more diverse than East Ham's. Um, so Pratt's history, I'm going to skip the 1809 embargo law, and I'm going to skip the war with Great Britain, the War of 1812, and focus on the October storm. How many of you have heard of any of those? Embargo law? A few. War of 1812? Yeah. A lot. October storm of 1839? One of you. October. It lasted for over 36 hours. Again, the epicenter was East Ham. Um, I need to find this. It was a tremendous storm. Many, many lives were lost. Shipping property was destroyed. And the salt works. More about the salt works later, but they were almost decimated. 1839 for the people of East Ham was really the year they measured things by. But in 1844, East Ham had two meeting houses, <coughs> two windmills, five schoolhouses. 170 families, 150 dwellings, and 950 people. And that was rather good. They also had salt works, some. They had poor land, but good grain crops. And also vegetable gardening, which provided enough for its own citizens as well as to send them to wealthy and province towns. According to Simeon Deo's history, published in 1890, one, again, the embargo, the War of 1812, but 1,700 widows' land grants. The town voted to award every widow in town four acres so that they would be able to have an income and live. Because if you've read any of the histories of women um, in that time, they had no means if their husbands had died. In the 1800s, um, salt manufacturing was really on its way. There was a canal from Boat Meadow River to Herring Pond. Now, <laughs> it occurred to me that that must be the little bridge under Herringbrook Road that we used to crawl through as kids from Lawton Pond, you know. That had to have been that canal. It wasn't Jeremiah's Gutter Canal. That was a different one. That was the Great Meadow, not, I mean, no, the other one. We'll get to it. It's in a map. Um, but, again, we had windmills and salt works. And if you wonder why East Ham was so treeless in any of the old photos that started being shown in the 1850s, consider that there were 100,000 feet of evaporation vats for the salt works in East Ham. They needed fuel to evaporate the salt from the seawater. In 1837, 
This is before <coughs> this October storm. There were 54 saltworks plants, and they yielded 22,500 bushels of salt every year. That's amazing. <coughs> the storm decimated that. During this time, cod and mackerel declined. Clams and oysters declined. Quahogs were sent to market. They weren't bought. They came back to East Ham. They threw them into salt pond. And the rest is history. They were the most succulent and successful quahogs that came out of salt pond, and they found a market in Boston. It's amazing what you find in the archives. <laughs> and there were new agricultural industries. The cranberry culture, asparagus, and turnips in the late 1800s. OK, back to the archives, back to turnips. Al and I found lots of surveys and reports. I'm not going to read them. You can read as well as I can. And several of these I'll comment on, but there's one in particular. The Mass <coughs> Historical Commission Reconnaissance Survey Town Report of East Ham, made in 1984. And I'm going to spend one minute on each of these periods. What it does, it divides East Ham's history into different historical periods contact, plantation, colonial, federal, early, industrial, and so on. And within each period, they look at the transportation routes, the population, the settlement patterns, the subsistence patterns, the economic base, and architecture. And it's fabulous, and it's easy to read and understand. And when people come asking about, I've just bought an old home, and it was built in, you know, what can you tell me about it? Let's go to the reconnaissance survey. <laughs> Ah, yes, here you go. I'm only going to focus on the subsistence patterns and the economic base because I want to focus on East Ham's agricultural um, history and roots and because that's what we're here for today. So the contact period. Subsistence was through hunting, fishing, gathering, wild plants and shellfish, and trade with the Native Americans. Some people say it was actually stealing from the Native Americans uh, corn and turkey wheat, but the survey brought that up also. <laughs> this is an illustration by Jim Owens um, from his coloring book, and I've used a couple of them in this survey, which shows the shellfish, the plants, the I just thought it fit. The rest of the illustrations are going to be maps from our map collections. Um, so the first one, plantation period. This map comes from the archives. It's very controversial because we're not sure of its accuracy. The histories say that the most fertile soil is in the south part of East Ham. They also say that six of the first seven settlers Cook, Smalley, Higgins, Dome, Banks, Prince, and Snow, received 200 acres each of good farmland. I don't think they would have received that good farmland in bands from north to south across the Cape. Most of them were situated closer to the South Precinct, what became the South Precinct in Orleans. But the crops were good. They were wheat, corn, other grains, English hay, salt marsh hay, which is actually, do you know what that's for? Yes. Cattle. Yeah. And fruit trees. Have you heard about Governor Prince's pear tree? Only if you love history. <laughs> Written up in, all, in the 1800s, he had a pear tree. It was 250 years old in the late 1800s. We have a piece of it at the Schoolhouse Museum. It's, um, come in and see it, and I'll give you the history of that. <laughs> the colonial period. 
This is actually not a map from colonial times. It's a map that was made by Henry David Thoreau as he walked East Ham's shores over three trips in the 1800s. But what I love about it is the colonial period um, focused on fishing industries and maritime activities rather than agricultural. So if you can see my little cursor here, Nauset Harbor is down in the corner here. Uh, Town Cove is right here. There was fishing in both of those. And, whoops, <laughs> other um, maritime activities at Cook's Brook. Cook's Brook was actually a brook, not a dirt road, parallel to steel road. It used to be steel road. Um, and they had weir fishing. Well, sorry. Touch. Um, grain was exported. And here's Boat Meadow down here. Here's Rock Harbor River. And here's Great Meadow River. So East Ham did have small harbors, but most of them got sanded in. So by the federal period, beginning around 1775, um, we had salt works, and they, I found this map, the, one of the directors up at the, map, at the Hyannis Maritime Museum, I used to take my students there when I taught at Sturgis, and he wrote asking if we had any old maps or photos of the salt works. And I happened to find this map by John Hales, and I wrote and said, do you have any idea, could these be salt works? Because it labeled the windmills and the schools and the churches, meeting houses, but it didn't label these funny little rectangular buildings or vats. And he said, you're absolutely right, salt works. And so this close-up shows the salt works at the town cove and Rock Harbor and everywhere. And it was still before that big storm of October. And East Ham exported crops, wheat, corn, and grains. As a matter of fact, um, never mind. I won't tell you that. In the early industrial period, I used the Wallingford map. And I love it because it has all the families and where they lived. So every little, every, you know, little name here is the name of a family. Maritime shipping was in decline. Uh, there were reasons. One was the storm. <laughs> they lost a lot of their boats and, and ships. Shipping went from 37 vessels to five in a period of 10 years. Um, the other reason was that other towns had better harbors. And so fishing declined, but as a result, agriculture became more important. And by the late industrial period, salt production was disappearing, the railroad came in, which developed market gardening. Little hamlets um, appeared and grew up around the depots. So here's the depot of Northeast Ham, way up here in the corner. Here's the depot right here, which was right down the street. And the railway is right up the center of this map. Um, The economy per capita of property valuation was abysmal. East Ham was one of the poorest. The, the value of property value was not even $300 per capita in 1875. But agriculturally, it was successful. There's a little dichotomy here that I can't quite understand. East Ham ranked seventh out of 15 towns. And the agricultural product value, 
not the land value, but the product was $45,000 and something. How? Don't ask me. Per capita, East Ham was first in producing agriculture. And cranberries and asparagus were making their way into the market. By 1905, East Ham led Cape Towns in the sale of vegetables um, at a value of about $27,000. 1905. And we come to the early modern period. I love this self-portrait of Jim Owens. <laughs> it's a gift he gave to Bob and Connie Wells, turnip farmers from East Ham. And they let me take a picture of it so I could use it in this slide presentation. So the key crops at this time were asparagus, turnips, carrots, and cranberries in that order. In the teens, a rust fungus had swept away the asparagus crop. And they didn't have it, which allowed these others to grow in size, um, in share, let's say. But very shortly, they just developed a rust-resistant strain of asparagus, and so it came right back, um, and even stronger. 1917, the probability of war loomed. And the Cape Cod Magazine, I think this is an article, a little snippet that Al found in the archives, and he said, do you think this is relevant? And we looked it over, and we thought, yes, it is. Because they wrote in April of 1917, our soil is to be cultivated this summer as if it never has been before. Garden patches long idle will again be plowed and farm, and farming on a larger scale will take a distinct step in advance. Prices are high, and the demand good locally and in the markets. While the Cape may never cut a great figure in the agricultural way, it is at least possible to supply the local demand to a much larger extent than has been the case in recent years. And I just loved that little piece from the Cape Cod Magazine. So the next slide, there's one final comparison. And this is East Ham and the other Cape towns and what they were well known, their best agricultural products in 1921. And we're the only ones. <coughs> it's asparagus and tunes. I just found it really, I, I love putting things in context I love determining a logical sequence for things. I can't always do that in, in this presentation. Um, but we found other things. We, um, so back to the archives. <laughs> we found books and memoirs and histories. And here are a few that we won't, I thought I could fit into the program. I can't. Time constraints. In the beginning, when Debbie said, Oh, it's only 50 minutes, I was like, oh, 50 minutes? And this morning it was like, What can I take out to make it so that it's 50 minutes? So we'll just take a dip into a few of these. I have to tell you that the first thing we're going to dip into is the old schoolhouse. So, Otto Nickerson <laughs> had a desk. And this desk had a scroll. He bought it from Sears Roebuck in 1924. And this is a blackboard which bends down to become a desk that you could use. And up on the scroll, you have different lessons, 55, all practical. Besides reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, history, geography, you had the signal flags, you had birds' eggs and birds and where to find them. You had farm tools and machine, uh, not machinery, it wasn't machinery quite then. <laughs> um, you had Roman numerals. Why you needed to know Roman numerals? 
you know why? If you wanted to be able to tell time, the clocks were all with Roman numerals back then. Anyway, this one are the vegetables that you would grow in East Ham. And there is a turnip there, quite prominent. So I went to Alice Lowe's book, History of Nosset on Cape Cod, and needed to make sense of a account book of Freeman Smith. Now he was Luther Smith, the old, the select man that I knew growing up. That was his grandfather, I think. And in the 1840s, this is what it cost for a bushel of all, for each of these products. But what I knew about bushels was the old song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I needed to be able to compare and to make sense. I went to Otto's desk in the old schoolhouse. And I found the lesson on standard weights and I found the lesson on dry measures. So down here we have a pint, a quart, a peck, whoops, we have and a bushel. And up here we have what a bushel of alfalfa was 60 pounds, a bushel of oats was 32 pounds, a bushel of potatoes was 50 pounds. And I went, aha, if a bushel of sweet potatoes is 50 pounds, and if potatoes are 50 cents a bushel, how much for a pound of potatoes? I used to teach math too. <laughs> Come on. 50-50. Yes, Mary Daly Brown gets it. One cent. <laughs> Had to get you in there. <laughs> and so it made sense to me. It would have made all the sense in the world to our parents, to Art Nick, to Ellie Pearson, <laughs> to you know, my Uncle Bob, any of your dad, John, anyone who went to that schoolhouse would have known this stuff. I didn't. Anyway. We went to memoirs. I pulled this book off the shelf. It's by, by Marion Kroll Ryder. She was 90 years old in 1972 when she published this book, which means she was born in about 1880. But she was a writer. <laughs> And she wrote a memory, and she in, within this memory, for Dennis, it was published by the Dennis Historical Society, she had a chapter called Harvest Time. And she talked about what harvest time meant. It meant gathering in the crop and storing it in the root cellar and digging your potatoes and getting your out, picking your apples and everything like that. But it also meant, and I'm going to read from her, hereabouts, it was thought that the best turnips available were raised in East Ham. And standing orders were placed with the farmers there for a winter's supply. The loaded boats would come across the bay from East Ham, and either by the grapevine method or the hoisted barrel signal, I love that image. <laughs> the word would get around, and all the carts would line up and head down to the shore and claim their share of the East Ham turnip crop. The usual order was a barrel of turnips to a family. And that's why I included this in the slideshow. <laughs> Here's another perspective, this by Don Sparrow, growing up on Cape Cod. Don was one of the young boys at the time who grew turnips, worked in the fields, and it wasn't quite as idyllic as <laughs> <laughs> the previous, yeah. <laughs> turnips fit in nicely with asparagus because the seeds were planted early in July and the plants matured in the fall. We disliked thinning and weeding the growing plants, 
But the really unpleasant task came late in the fall at harvesting time, after the first frost. We pulled the five to eight inch diameter purple topped white turnip, shaved the small roots with a razor sharp six inch knife, tossed it in the air, caught it by the cleaned end, locked off the leaves. Our flimsy brown cotton gloves, intended to keep our hands warm, <laughs> were soaked in short order, and our icy fingers became numb. numb. It's a miracle that none of us lost a finger to that murderous knife. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had a frost yet. How are people going to get their turnips for Thanksgiving? Rhetorical question. I have no idea. But last week, I visited Bob and Connie Wells at Redberry Farm. And that's the farm where the fourth graders go over from the elementary school every year and plant the turnips. And then the next year, as fifth graders, they go back and they harvest them. So they're getting a really good education about turnips. This is a knife that was custom made for Bob by a friend. And he said it's the best knife for harvesting turnips that he's ever had. This is one of his fields with a little watering can for perspective, and a close-up of one of the turnips. One thing I hadn't considered was the intensity of the labor. Actually, I don't think any of us who are not farmers realize the intensity of the labor that goes into it. Orange is not in your head, yep. <laughs> um, so they tried to explain to me, Bob and Connie, the stages of turnip cultivation. And you didn't want to wait until after the second or the third frost. It had to be after the first. So time was of the essence. And snow or rain, <laughs> today the harvesting would continue. Um, I have a harvesting story for you. And I love it. It's everywhere in our archives. It's on Digital Commonwealth's East Ham Memories Roadshow. And I thank Audrey for putting it up there because it concerns her grandfather. Noel Vile wrote about it. Articles in the papers wrote about it. But here it is. George Nickerson, who was Art Nickerson's father, had was struck down with appendicitis, and that was complicated by pneumonia. So he could not get to his turnip fields. And they really needed, the crop of turnips needed pulling, trimming, and pitting. All of East Ham turned out. Friends, neighbors, members of the Odd Fellows, East Ham farmers, family, they all came to his aid. And this picture shows the men Working in pairs, you'll see two by two by two, doing what Don Sparrow described as the pulling, the cutting, the flipping, the cutting off the tops and everything. And then they would put them, they would do a bushel at a time, and then they would be dumped into freshly dug pits, and they saved one turnip out of every bushel so they would know at the end of the day how many bushels they had done. And Art Benner describes the turnip kits and what they looked like. And I found this old grainy photo in a scrapbook um, in the archives. It wasn't dated, but the young man on the right hand, right -hand side is Art Nick as a 14-year-old and his grandfather, Samuel, digging a pit. So, Art says that the pits, how, how large are they? They're 30 to 36 inches deep, <laughs> 30 inches wide by 8 to 10 feet long. And they would hold about 20 to 30 bushels each. And those turnips in the pit would be layered with seaweed and sand, beach sand, 
for insulation and ventilation. And at the end of the day, 1,400 bushels were ready for market. That's 60 or 70 pits. There are two people that I, I know in this photo. Here in the front, I'm pretty sure this is Art Nick. And here in the back is Otto Nickerson. <laughs> I just love that story. Thank Audrey, thank you very much for putting it up where I can find it. <laughs> but I started with harvesting and I should have started with seeds. <laughs> Bob and Connie tried to explain the process of getting seeds for turnips. And I'm going to do it very quickly because Art Benner explains it in detail later on. So what you do is you pull the turnip, when you pull the turnips, you save some and you replant them, the whole turnip. And that then comes up as a separate kind of bush, I mean plant, with a long stalk, yellow flowers, seed pods, and then the seed pods eventually become dry and you take a sickle and you cut them up and you separate the seeds from the chaff, so to speak. And this is a picture of Art Nick and his favorite, favorite separating tool. And I just love that. It's a beautiful old comb. So the harvesting and the planting, very important. Oh, and Bob told me that a pint and a half, oh wait, back. See these little black dots over here? Those are turnip seeds. That's how big they are, like a poppy seed. Right over here. And it, I can't even imagine. And you would plant them about 18 inches apart. I, I went to the Randall Tool Museum um, to look for farm tools that might have been used for turnips. And I found a uh, broadcast cedar. I actually found two. And it looked like it would be used for them. You carried them and you went like this and it broadcast the seeds up. Um, but Art had his own um, vintage Planet Junior number 300 turn up turn, which he used <laughs> right up until he stopped using doing turnips. And so. Uh, one aspect that we have that I didn't consider, and I found this in this book by Jo Nugent. She wrote it. It's a pamphlet, 28 pages. It's called Working the Land. It's all about East Ham, and it was for the East Ham's 350th anniversary. Um, and so here she writes about asparagus, but I'm focusing on turnips. And she said, oh, one thing, the peak years of asparagus cultivation in the 1920s, Art Nick said to her, you could drive from Orleans to Northeast Ham on Route 6 and see nothing but plowed fields on either side. Much of it asparagus, but some planted with turnips and carrots. And that must have been such a sight. So the East Dam turnip groves, as you know, developed this seed for the special East Dam turnip. And pretty sure I mentioned that the asparagus was harvested by 4th of July. That's when the turnip started. So although they didn't use the same fields, they could do both crops in a particular year. And so it kept them going throughout the hard times. Um, East Ham had a farmers association to help them with marketing. Of course they needed help with marketing. East Ham was down here on the lower Cape. How do you get your produce and crops to Boston or to Providence or to New York? And so in 1924, they founded an association. 
At the very first meeting, um, by the end of that meeting, unfortunately, only 12 had signed up for the association. And Leslie Chase, who was the president of the association at the time, was very disappointed. But he also understood. And I think this is a wonderful comment about farmers. He said, all farmers lead an independent life. And of course, to enter into an organization of this kind, a certain amount of restriction is placed upon that independence, which though profitable, may at the same time be distasteful. So totally understood. But despite the reluctance of some of the farmers, um, the East Ham Farmers Association actually brought fame and glory and profit to East Ham. This was their label. It's the Nosset brand coming out of the lighthouse. There was a huge banner that hung on the side of Fannel Hall up in Boston that proclaimed the Nosset brand was the best brand. And by the 1940s, um, when they saw the cash advantages of be being a member of the organization, many more farmers joined it. So I'm going to keep quiet. I still have about seven minutes, and I have just time for you to hear some of these Tam's turnip farmers. Um, Art Nick and Joe King, Sam Brackett and his family had a huge farm, grew turnips, and the grocery store. Um, I typed out the tape script because it's not super clear. Let's hope this works. Please tell me you're connecting.
dwindling number of old East Hamites that we associate with the town when it was farming asparagus and turnips and not tourists. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's Uncle George. <laughs> Does anyone remember the name of his horse? We can't remember it, Pat. I remember his housekeeper's name. Amelia. Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> This is our Venice. This is a much clearer recording. Uh, and this is when I, you'll get it. I'm just going to play it. <laughs> Let's see. Do that. Do that.
So the pressure samples went by. So when you were down in the hands of the agency, the agency was crammed here for the cranberry story. They didn't do it in the machine in those days. And uh, but I used to tell how some parents raised traffic and the asparagus had gone by, but that would no more asparagus and still raised turnips there. Turnips, though, the last year my father had planted turnips. He sent the opera truck used to come on and tell them to uh, market in Boston, and uh, then they would pay what the going price was. Well, the last load that he sent, he's got to go back to the freight. They didn't pay anything for his turnips, so that was the end of his turnips. So. That was the end of his turnips, she said. And that's almost the end of this presentation. Um, this is for Jeff. <laughs> Recipes, Jeff. <laughs> You can go searching for East Ham turnips, and if you search for images on Google, you'll find more things than if you just search for East Ham turnips. And in the archives, if you go searching, you also find lots of old headlines from newspapers. Um, the Cape Cod, the Oracle, the, I mean, everything. And there were many, many turnip growers in East Ham. But for what I had and the time constraints that I had, I focused on the two that I missed. Um, in the archives, these are works that I cited from, <laughs> and these are works that Alfred and I consulted and didn't cite from. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Alfred, and thank you.